Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Hey, welcome back. This is Tim and Julie Harris, and we've got a great topic for you today. And this is what we're calling five must-know success secrets. So Julie, let's talk about what a success secret with regard to uh, today's topic, what it really truly means. Well, we're talking about what is called moments of truth. And a moment of truth is a first impression or a snapshot of you, your business, your personality, your track record, and ultimately your reputation. So when you do this right, this can create a competitive advantage. And when you do it wrong, that's what causes people to, as you guys lovingly call it, ghost you. So let's talk about where we originally learned this concept. I think you guys will all appreciate this. When Julie and I sold real estate, we sold real estate in um, in the end of our career in a place, end of real estate selling career in a place called New Albany, Ohio. Those of you who are in New Albany um, feel blessed because it is still probably, well, it is the most beautiful master plan community we've ever seen. And uh, New Albany was home to all the corporate headquarters for businesses like Victoria's Secret, Bath and Body Works, Lerner, Lane Bryant, Abercrombie, uh, Abercrombie and Fitch, a long, long, long list of clothing retailers had their corporate headquarters, and most executives lived in New Albany. And uh, we have, we we're blessed with having many of those as our past clients, as our uh, continued friends, actually. So one of them in particular was this gal that specialized in being. Um, she worked for Victoria's Secret, and she um, educated us on what today's topic is going to be. And then Julie and I took this concept, and then we applied it to real estate, our real estate coaching business, first our own real estate business, then our real estate coaching business. But here's the interesting thing we learned from uh, Margaret, was her name, as an overview. They said She was telling us that in Victoria's Secret, in the, in the retail stores in particular, they are, uh, I don't even know how to describe how uh, focused they are on moments of truth. They are so incredibly focused on what your every uh, millisecond of experience is as you walk through the store. And then she also talked a little bit uh, about websites and things like that. But her main focus was the new stores. And so I'll give you guys an example. I always, I think this is pretty incredible. Now, whether you've been into a Victoria's Secret or not, it doesn't really matter. The uh, fact is that all businesses, all retail businesses work basically the same. You have by design, various stages of people, salespeople that are greeting you. And in uh, Victoria's Secret, the least experienced salesperson was the one that greeted you the second when you walked in. So if you were working at Victoria's Secret, again, really any retailer, any um, mostly I would say high-end, high customer service retailer is going to have that same experience. You have similar experiences when you walk into hotels. You have similar experiences when you have, you, so just realize this is exactly the way your customer expects to be treated when coming into contact with you and your real estate business. So the first person that would meet you when you walked into the uh, Victoria's Secret knows that the most people when uh, asked, can I help you, are going to give them some sort of, you know, I'm just looking type answer. And most people are, but this, the reality of it is, is that the second greeter, there's three of them, by the way, the second greeter that one would run across as they walk deeper into the Victoria's Secret store, that person knows that if you've been in the store long enough to walk, you know, halfway into the store, you're not just looking, you're there to buy something. And that person's going to have the measuring thing around her neck and she's going to know more about the sizes and the products and all the nuanced you know, differences of the fits and whatever. And in most cases, if someone's ready to purchase something, she's going to pick them out and she's going to be the one that helps them, you know, buy all the stuff they need to buy. Now, what you don't know or maybe don't know is there was another person that would be in the back. And the one in the back would be designed to – there. that's the person that would appear more passive. So they would be stacking things, organizing things. But uh, what they were really doing is they were looking for the person that made it past the first grader to the second grader. And if they were all the way in the back of the store, for sure they were looking to buy something. And her approach was less aggressive than the second grader. You guys get how all this is all, you know, worked out? It's pretty incredible. But it's all by design. They all have different missions and they're all looking at at, uh, customers differently. Different scripts, different product knowledge. It's all organized. Right. And so everything, and uh, when Julie and I learned that, we sort of, I think, um, knew it. But to have uh, someone explain to us how much it's actually modeled out at a retail level, and then we, that uh, changed our perspective, again, not only in our own real estate business, but really in all businesses uh 
how many, like how does any time you come into contact, even if with an online business, what's your experience like? What's your experience like afterwards? Most retail, uh, anybody online trying to sell you something, their experiences are all basically identical, right? Because they're all using similar software. But when you come across a retailer, Zappos would be a for example. So Zappos has a different, they approach customer service in a different level that people would buy shoes from Zappos just because of the customer service experience, not because they necessarily could get a, uh, couldn't get a, uh, the same product someplace else for cheaper. And when you start really, again, internalizing how important all these tiny little moments of truth are, it really does change your perspective because this gives you an unfair advantage in the marketplace. So if you're trying to compete, as you are, don't be confused about the word, if you're trying to compete in your marketplace with other real estate practitioners, brokerages, teams, whatever, it's these tiny little nuanced differences that are going to make the difference as to whether or not they do business with you. And so what Julie's going to do is she's going to go through the notes that she wrote for everyone, and she's going to be describing to you exactly the types of moments of truth that you should be searching for. Now, I'm going to give you a little homework assignment at the top of today's pod before we get into this. You remember when Margaret... I think she had insisted on me called Marguerite, by the way. Mm -hmm. But do you remember when she told us uh, about how they would uh, uh, basically send shoppers in yes. to check the stores? Mm -hmm. uh, so a shopper, and again, this is something we've been coaching our uh, top clients to do for a long time. You find somebody who's going to act as a seller and then another person that's going to act as a buyer. And then they come in contact with all the different ways that, you know, they send an email, they send a text, all the different places where you're supposed to be or your staff is supposed to be monitoring um, you know, for new leads or just overall customer experience. And so you send a shopper in to test all those different, look for weaknesses, at, at, basically. When you do that in your own a real estate practice, you're going to be shocked. Then what you can do is you can send those same shoppers in to shop your competitors and you can quickly find out where they're really, really uh, great at something and when they're uh, not so great at something. And then you can then um, scale up your business that way. So for example, Julie and I knew that most of our competitors, when we were listing real estate, were not that great at returning uh, phone calls, even if it was a come list me type seller. Yep. And so we knew one of the ways that we could differentiate ourselves was have all the direct seller calls uh, go directly to Julie and I's cell phone. They had to go through a little bit of a switchboard, but at the end of the day, it went directly to us. We removed any kind of intermediaries or middlemen between us and the prospective seller. And one of the things that the sellers would tell us, and this is just giving you guys an idea of how important all this stuff is, is they would say, Tim and Julie, um, I was going to list with so-and-so, but the fact is you guys called us back right away and she called us back the next day or something along those lines. You guys get it? Or worse, they often would say, I left a message two days ago and I have yet to be called back. Or an assistant called me back. Yes. You know, things like that. So these tiny little nuanced approaches, which really do not require very much effort. They just require you being conscientious of what your uh, prospective consumer's experience is going to be or your current client's experience is. It makes all the difference in those little tiny nuanced differences accumulate over time where you start, you start to have in your business starts to have this certain unidentifiable, as the French like to say, je ne sais quoi. There's something about doing business with Bob and, uh, you know, Margaret's real estate company. Why, what is special about them? It's because they are very sensitive to the tiny little moments of truth. So open your mind as Julie's going through these points. That's right. And, you know, moments of truth can be good or they can be bad. So monitor and do that checklist. What's, this is one of the things the coaches do to some coaching clients. Okay, so uh, before we get to that, let's talk because Tim and I have been getting a lot of you guys asking about the housing market. Stop listening, reading, and hanging out with negative people. Yes, there is a market shift happening, and yes, you can thrive, but you also need a newly updated business and lead generation plan, and of course, we have it for you. So the best part is it's no cost to you. You can reserve your complimentary session now by typing join, texting, J texting I'm sorry, t texting join, J-O-I-N, to 47372. That way we can help you navigate through this changing market. All right, moments of truth, yes. So guys, go ahead and do that now. Text the word join to 47372. Text J-O-I-N to 47372. And when you do, you will be able to schedule yourself directly with one of our new member coaches. Uh, there's no callback. There's no nothing. You guys will be sent a link. You have to text the word back yes. And then we send you the link to schedule. It is an exact schedule page that goes directly to three of our new member coaches. They will then uh, call you on the scheduled day, your day and time that you choose. And they're going to help you create a plan for the rest of the year, your lead generation plan and your business plan for the rest of 2000. 
2022 into the future. So do go ahead and text the word JOIN to 47372. Text the word JOIN to 47372. We had a lot of people that scheduled themselves for free coaching calls, and I believe uh, today and the next day we have maybe, I'll have to check, but something like 10 or 15 spots open. Obviously, there's only so much time in the day for us to be providing this free service to you guys, but text the word JOIN to 47372. And while you're on your coaching call, they'll also let you know about the different options that we have to help you guys uh, learn uh, how to survive and thrive in this new real estate market that we're definitely entering into. So text the word JOIN to 47372. Remember, message and data rates may apply. Yes. And in fact, you mentioned the changing market. I think when things are getting a little bit uncertain, people are even more critical about these moments of truth. So I want you to take some notes. You've got two different segments. Online, your moments of truth are things like Facebook, Instagram, clubs, memberships, charities, Google. We're going to drill down on these in a second. And offline, your moments of truth can be your voicemail message, your sign, your home brochures. Tim mentioned how fast you call people back your car, your handshake, your wardrobe, your haircut, glasses, and the list goes on. And today's podcast, this is kind of an overview. We really drill down on this in the Harris Rules book. It's got its own dedicated chapter. And by the way, Harris Rules, of course, is available on Amazon and every major bookseller. It's also available on Audible, and uh, it's uh, over 500 five-star reviews. So make sure you get your copy of Harris Rules. And like Julie said, we in Harris Rules give you lots of little micro lists of things that you should be considering as moments of truth. Some of the easily overlooked things, uh, and I remember Julie and I, again, we'll try to avoid a lot of stories, but you go on a listing appointment and you walk into some fancy dancy house and you take off your shoes, and let's say it's a really nice house and they leave their shoes by the front door, and you take off your shoes and your shoes are not some high flutin brand that they or will yeah. come to expect. You know, like this is people will make these little subconscious decisions as to whether or not you're like them or not like them. And I promise you guys, these tiny little mo- moments of truth will add up. If you take off your shoes, I know this sounds stupid, but this is true. You take off your shoes and they look in the driveway and you have a really nice car. Well, those will probably, you know, balance out. But if they, you take off your shoes and if they're not nice shoes and sitting in the driveway, some not nice car, uh, and you're wanting to list a really expensive house, there's a disconnect between what they expect from you and what um, essentially how you're appearing. It'd be similar to what we are giving you as an example as far as the Victoria's Secret and the overall experience you have on that retail level. You, are, you don't have a storefront, so you physically are your storefront. How you look, how you act, your moments of truth, how you appear. I mean, guys, what you smell like, what you wear, the words you choose. What you don't smell like. <laughs> exactly, what you don't you smell like. You had onions for lunch. Go brush your teeth. Come right. on. And that, so these, again, your, your retail storefront is you. So start with when you're thinking about this stuff. If you're not finding yourself attracting the type or the level of clients that you want, it's probably because there's a disconnect in how you present yourself in your own moments of truth and what they perceive that they're looking for and who they hire as a real estate practitioner. Yes, that's true. And those of you who are on the younger or less experienced end of the scale, I have a quick story you and I experienced about a week ago. We often look at houses just for fun here. And we went to a showing that was uh, an older, more experienced agent. And then I swear this kid looked like he was 12, right? But here's the thing, also a licensee. The younger agent was dressed a lot nicer and was more, I don't know, there was some, I think that he's going to be really successful. And the older agent like was wearing sweatpants or something. Yeah, it's true. And this was not a cheap house. Well, it was, uh, long story short, it was a friend of ours who was looking for a, prop, a house in our actual neighborhood. And we knew about some properties that weren't actually for sale. Long And, and like I'm trying to express to you guys, the inexperienced, supposedly new agent was dominating the conversation versus this more the the buyer who did not know either one of these agents, not even by reputation. He was uh, because the list. I'm trying not to confuse you guys, but <laughs> yeah. here's what happened: this new agent who had uh, who was dressed nicely, who was presenting himself more professionally, the age or the buyer that we were helping uh, trying to find a house. And again, we were just doing this as a friend. We don't we don't have real estate licenses in Puerto Rico. He was leaning into this kid who was representing this, uh, I said kid, but he was, who was representing this other listing, and he was ignoring the buyer's agent that he uh, brought along with him. So the buyer's agent was vastly more experienced, but the- Vastly more casual, but the Right, but the buyer perceived that the other agent was more professional and started, after not very long, ignoring the more experienced agent. And the younger kid, I bet you, ends up picking up that guy as a client because of- 
exactly what we're talking about in today's podcast. That's right. So competitive advantage. We're going to talk about online first. So point number one, ask yourself on your online profiles, what are you trying to accomplish Which e with each of those online moments of truth? Are you trying to attract buyers and sellers? Are you trying to make realtor connections? Are you trying to manage your reputation? Can I not tell what you're trying to do when I go to some of your online profiles? And have them all be the same too. That's really important. Consistency. It's, consistency really matters. And again, people will rule you in or rule you out based on how your profiles. For some of you who don't know what a profile is, it's what you find when you go to any social site, if you go to Twitter, if you go to LinkedIn. Have the picture be the same on every single site. Have Make sure all the profile information is filled out with all your contact information. I know it is a hassle to have people message you through different platforms, but such is the way. You have to meet the customer where they are. And if you think they're going to meet you where you are in a retail business, you are wrong. You have to check your you, – there's different systems where you can have all these messages that you might get from Twitter and LinkedIn and all these other places where you can have them forwarded or you can just set them up to forward to your main Gmail or whatever email box. Uh, but don't ignore any of these platforms because some people are only on Twitter. Some people are only on Instagram. If they see your profile and they message you and you don't message them back, you're dead to them at that point. They just forget they even contacted you in the first place. That's right. So point number two, what does your profile look like you're looking for? Are you a fisherman or are you a realtor? Are you an investor or are you a broker? Are you both? Does your side hustle show up ahead of your profession? Pretend you're a homeowner thinking about selling. We talked about the secret shopper and in going into uh, Victoria's Secret, for example, and seeing what the experience was like. Pretend you're a homeowner thinking about selling your home and your name has come up. Okay, Maybe somebody referred your name to them. What will they see when they search you online? Is it consistent? The pictures that Tim talked about, what is the impression? Point number three, do you monitor your different assets or do you set it and forget it? You know when you go and you see somebody's profile and it seems like they haven't been there for three years? So monitor your profiles. Number four, do you have any unfinished profiles? Shadow pictures and haven't posted an update since 2018? They might think you're not even in business anymore. Search your name, guys. Go in online and search as if it was a customer looking for information about you. Don't you, like 100% of the time, before you make a new friend or you're going on a listing appointment or you're working with a new buyer, how frequently do you go online and search out uh, any information you can on them? Well, customers are going to do the exact same thing. And I'm here to tell you guys all your Zillow, you know, all the different things you've built on all these real estate sites as far as uh, trying to get ratings. It means a hell of a lot less than the information that they find on just your generic LinkedIn profile. Because the real estate sites where you have all your ratings, where you've spent all this time and energy getting all these ratings, means less to an average consumer than, say, for example, how you present yourself on Facebook. It just does. They don't trust the real estate sites. They are assuming that those were somehow bought uh, testimonials versus, say, for example, again, how you appear on LinkedIn. All this little stuff matters. As far as where to have profiles, have profiles on any, like, here, here's what to do. Go to your, go to Google and do a search on who your biggest perceived competitor is or the most seasoned agent and make a list of all the places where they have profiles pop up. They're my, they certainly going to have a profile come up on uh, Facebook. They're going to have a profile come up on LinkedIn. They're going to have a profile come up on, um, I mean, it could be all Pinterest, all kinds of different things. And then go and have profiles in the exact same places and make sure, like, again, if you have a real dominant agent you're competing against, Click on their profiles on, you know, click on their Pinterest profile or whatever and see what they've built out. And sometimes you can do a lot of really creative link backs to your main website. You never know how people are going to find you. Your, your storefront is essentially virtual. And then when they finally meet you, so make it so that it's easy for them to communicate with you. And don't be one of these butthead agents who said, I'm only going to communicate peop with people through text. Well, you're just not going to do any business because younger people are maybe going to want to search you through, you know, I used Instagram as an example. Like I'll, I'll tell you guys for sure that we get probably as many messages on our Instagram page. It's at Tim and Julie Harris. Uh, that's you know, on our on uh, Instagram to, at Tim and Julie Harris that we do when I give my cell phone number out. So a lot of people are on Instagram would prefer just to message us through Instagram more so than even texting me directly. Now that's a pretty significant change in consumer behavior. I'm here to tell you, but it's something that I have to be conscious of. And I'm not going to say, well, I'm not going to respond to any messages on Instagram. That'd be silly. I obviously have to go to where the customer is. And so do you guys. So point number five, do you have any CTAs? That's a call to action. Are you offering a free competitive market analysis on your, you know, your business page or a confidential consultation? 
you might be posting lots of great information, but not asking the viewer to actually communicate with you. One of the greatest CTAs that Julie and I ever did to generate listing leads wasn't actually a, a, a um, you know free CMA. It was actually a CMA designed to help them uh, contest their property taxes and get their property taxes lowered. And we would have that. We would offer that especially when we knew property taxes were due. And the gist of it is, is in most states, for someone to contest their property tax. There's a form that they download from the, the whatever the state's uh, auditors, whatever it is. And then you can download this form and then they have to uh, provide the consumer or the homeowner has to then provide usually what, Julie, three comps or whatever? Typically, yep. And typically that's it. You just send it in. In most cases, the city is going to uh, do some sort of nominal adjustment to whatever the property tax was and lower it to a, a, you know, adjust it to a lower amount. You then, as the uh, practitioner that's offering this free service, have done a huge service to that perspective that for that seller and maybe that prospective future listing for you because you've helped them to save money. And all you've got to do basically is down, pre-download that form and you know essentially save it, obviously. And then when they request your help to contest their property taxes, in some states, there's frankly a lot of states where attorneys do this, but this is basically all they do. It's not any fancier than this. And then you give them the three comps that would justify a lower comp. And then you uh, fill out the form for them. Or you give them the comps and send them the comps in the form and have them fill it out themselves. You've now made a friend for life because you've helped them save money. Yeah, especially now when property values are going up so quickly and people's property taxes are going right up with them. So this, you, this is a very good post to be doing. If you live in our old, old home state of Texas where there is no income tax, they pretty much make it up through uh, property taxes. Yes. Because everyone owns a home, even if you wouldn't normally pay income tax because maybe you didn't earn enough money. If you've got property, you're paying 2%. I guess up in Dallas, it's over 3%. It three. Yeah. It's extraordinary. And what's the average sale price in Austin right now, Julie? Well, I believe 780 as of this morning. Yeah, it's incredible. So if you're paying, it was a, it's 2.8%? It's 2.2 to 2.8, depending. Yeah, yeah. so you think about that. If you have a million-dollar house and you live in Austin, Texas, you're paying twenty to $30,000 a year in property taxes. And they reassess all the time. They yeah. do. They do it every year. And we yeah. used to contest it every year. And every year we would um, – there was actually an attorney we would use. And he would – how would we pay him? He'd end up getting some sort of percent. Yeah, they, they – make their money from some percent of what they save you. Right. But we could have done it ourselves and you can do it yourself or you can offer that as a service. And there were some people that we knew, agents that we knew that were doing this every tax year. They would do it as a great way to uh, ingratiate themselves to prospective sellers. There's You call me and you say, hey, Tim, I'm going to help you lo uh, you know save potentially thousands of dollars per year. Uh, you know, No strings attached. Trust me when I tell you, <laughs> I'm going to remember you favorably. That's right. And what a great segue into a real estate conversation, because if somebody is getting worked up about their property taxes, maybe they're thinking about selling too. Right. So uh, now we're going to do offline moments of truth to monitor and polish. And these can be really fun for you to work on and also really critical. So point number one, call your own mobile number. Do you sound friendly, approachable, and professional? Or did you record that message while you were driving with an ambulance in the background <laughs> and a screaming kid? I actually heard one of those yesterday. Would you leave a message for you or would you look at your phone like, are you kidding me? And just hang up. So call your own mobile number. It might have been a year or two since you even made that recording. Point number two, your sign. Remember that your real estate sign is one of your most important moments of truth. Have you hot rodded it as we outlined in a previous podcast called How to Hot Rod Your Real Estate Sign? Right. Just go to YouTube or, or go to, um, I was about to say Instagram, go to YouTube, go to iTunes, go to our main website, timandjulieharris.com, and just do a search. Just put in the word hot rod and you'll see the hot rodded uh, real estate sign podcast and listen to that. And Julie just said it. The most, it's incredible actually, almost in every market. Uh, in almost every neighborhood across the United States and really most of the world, you can actually put a, a really large, and we had, what was it, three by, it was enormous. It's like three by four or something like that. It was right. big. A really big for sale sign. Most brokerages use the small signs that are uh, sold by the local sign company. But here's a little advanced tip for you guys. Call up and find out from zoning what the largest for sale sign you can install in uh, for your listings. And you will find that in many cases, it's twice the size of the sign that your all your competitors are using. And here's a great moment of two, uh, truth. And we prescribe this to all of our coaching clients is that you will have that as an unfair advantage when getting a listing, when you're competing for a listing, 
because your sign is going to be twice the size. Imagine you selling this to a seller. Why? Just this tiny little nuance difference makes all the difference. You're not only going to have a larger for sale sign, Mr. Seller, but my signs are reflective. So if someone's driving up the street and it's at night and right and their headlights hit one of uh, our signs and it's in your front yard, that sign's going to glow. It's made of the same exact uh, material that a stop sign is made. That right there, a larger sign that's reflective, not only will that impress upon the seller, a little tiny nuance difference between you and everybody else, but it's also going to A, grab attention from other prospective sellers in the neighborhood. And guess what? You're also going to get more buyer calls from it as well because they paid attention to it. Where we used to sell real estate, there was gobs of snow. Some of mm -hmm. you guys experienced the same yeah. thing. Nothing's more powerful. And the signs uh, company that we used was called Reflective Real Estate. They're still around. I've checked. Yeah. I think, yeah. were they in Ohio? I think they were. And the, the cool thing about reflective real estate uh, signs is, yes, all, you know, obviously it's reflective, but they last a lot longer. Yeah. They're much sturdier. They're much brighter. And it is a point of difference. And I it drives me bonkers in today's market where things have fairly low days on the market, of course. I've actually read some of the realtor stuff online. Why are you bothering to even use a sign? Why would you do that? It's right. going to sell in 22 seconds. Well, you're totally missing the point. What's the value? I mean, honestly, this is just something that's so funny. If you you and I, we're going to start a new business. Here's mm -hmm. the new business, okay? okay? You and I are, and this isn't possible, and I'll explain to listeners why in a second. We're going to start uh, contacting homeowners, and we're going to ask to put, say, like a three by, you know, a huge for a sign in their front yard. Sure. And then we're going to sell advertising on that sign. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go yeah. to everyone and every you know yard in the United States, and we're going to give them you know, twenty five dollars a month, a hundred dollars a month in exchange, or maybe five hundred dollars a month in exchange for us putting what amounts to a mini billboard in their front yard. How much is a business like that worth? Gosh, tons. That would it's be amazing. the most valuable business on the planet. Absolutely. Earth because here's the thing: real estate is in occasionally temporary signs for uh, put, uh, politics and whatnot are the only types of signs that in most markets zoning allows in people's yards. And that is incredible. So if, for example, I bet you if you could you know, create this fictitious company idea I, uh, I just gave you, if you could create that, you would be an instant billionaire. Everyone would be going, holy crap, of course that <laughs> idea is going to work. Who I know. Would, and yet you guys are kind of lazy about it sometimes. What would you guys pay to put for sale or put not even for sale signs, but essentially mini billboards in all the house and all your neighbor's houses uh, front yards uh, everywhere. You would pay an unlimited amount of money. Everyone would. That's the power of a for sale sign. And yet some of you guys don't think for sale signs are important. Well, they take it for granted. So not anymore. The other thing to think about from your sign, is it easy to reach you or does your prospect have to get out of their car and scan a QR code or navigate your office's voicemail tree just to get the price on the house? Make it easy to reach you, not more difficult. On your for sale sign, and you guys will have to you know, make this so that it's legal in your market, you need to have your cell phone number um, as prominent as any other phone number. Now, where you, if you live in an air, a market that, where the broker's phone number has to be equal prominence with the agent's phone number, um, then obviously you have to follow the rules. But here's what some of our coaching clients have done. You, the way you can, like for example, if you put a phone number that's really large and it's your cell phone number, and your state requires that the broker's phone number be more dominant or prominent than the agent's phone number, well, then you're going to get yourself in trouble. But what if on that cell phone bill, it no longer just says, you know, Bob Smith, and now says Bob Smith, you know, EXP Royalty, right? In other words, you're then putting the invoice or the bill, the name of the account holder is not just your name personally, but it's also the name of your brokerage. In most states, that legally qualifies that phone number as being the broker's phone number. Now, in some cases, you're going to have to list that phone number with the state so that it's then obviously going to be on record for whatever your division of real estate is as being the broker's phone number. But that's not a big deal. Just attend uh, the uh, filing with the state. And then your phone number can start appearing on your for sale signs in your it's your cell phone. Your cell phone number in particular is one of the most important assets of your real estate business because it follows you forever. And what a lot of people will do is will save their phone, your phone number, your cell phone number in their phones, obviously. And again, they'll text you and whatnot. So that's a little advanced coaching for all of you. Use that at the highest level. Julie and I did that and it was an enormous asset. Matter of fact, when we got out of selling real estate, our old real estate phone number actually became a sellable asset. That's right. So point number three, your car. Yes, this matters. If you put a buyer in your car to take them to see the listing they're dying to buy, are they impressed or do they wonder what that unidentifiable smell is? Do in they the want car. to get the heck out of there? Right. <laughs> okay. 
So watch what's going on with your car. Number four. Well, you okay. know, this is something the agents talk about all the time. You okay. know, should I buy an expensive car? Should I? There are cars in the marketplace that have this ability to appeal to upper end consumers and to normal people without offending other gr- either groups. And, you know, honestly, in some markets, for example, I'm thinking of uh, Russ Williamson, right? Mm-hmm. So if R- Russ drives a, last time we saw him when we lived in Texas, mm-hmm. he drove a, a, a Ford F-150. Yep. A Ford F-150, mm-hmm. uh, King Ranch, four-door, something Very like Texas. that. Right. So he could drive up to the, you know, grain and feed and throw a bunch of whatever mm-hmm. in the back. Or he could drive up to a, you know, $14 million mansion. It's all, totally that, fine. that's a kind of vehicle that basically works in all kinds of different markets. Um, I would say if you're in L.A., Anything uh, like a Tesla, that's going to work in any price range. That's one of those things. There's only a handful of cars like that where you're not all of a sudden pigeonholed as having a certain set of values. That It's kind of like a non-denominational car. And it can go both ways, like too nice or not nice enough. Right. You know, so and we have a chapter in the book about this too. All right, so your car number four. I put a lot of stuff into one point number four because again, in the book we drill down on all this really specifically. Your handshake, your haircut, your glasses, your attire. First impressions can make you or break you. So spend some time upgrading everything. If you haven't changed your glasses in three or four years, maybe it's time to do something like that. Well, coming out of COVID too, a lot of people yeah. let themselves go a little mangy. <laughs> you might be too hairy. I don't yeah. know. So a modern haircut, clean cut, air on the side of everything being nicer than your prospects. And that is harder to do than you think the older you get because it's very <laughs> easy to get dug in yeah. and, and not realize that you're starting to look a bit like an artifact. So one of the things you can do is you got to make yourself, well, first of all, this it's really important. Whatever it takes, keep yourself as youthful looking and feeling as possible, especially as you get older, because there's something in the subconscious hu- human brain. This is just an observation. It's not an opinion necessarily. It's just what we've observed. As people get older, society in general starts to discount them. And in, in other words, mm-hmm. if you think that, w- yes, when you get older, especially in sales, especially if you've been successful for a long period of time, you've got the momentum of your past effort. But what happens is there's a tipping point where if you start to look mangy, if you start to look old, if you start to dress like, you know, somebody who's not in touch with what modern people are thinking, you're going to find yourself, despite your uh, huge amount of experience in the past, you're going to start having a business that declines on you because people are starting to write you off. They're going to look at you and they're going to say, that's Bob. He used to be a rock star 10 years ago. But, you know, now look at them. You know, those types of things. I know this sounds very judgy, but you guys do it too. You'll do it on the opposite direction. You might see somebody that's, you know, running around on a hoverboard with, I don't even know what, you know, listen to me, but whatever kids are wearing today, right? Wearing bright colors with some sort of, you know, just different things that you personally don't find appealing. But the reality of it is, is they're killing it in business or whatever they're selling because they are uh, dressed appropriate. They're market correct with what their mark with their particular clients are expecting and here's the really crazy thing successful high-end people will absolutely pay attention even if you're older to whether or not you are trying to uh, not overly look youthful but whether or not you're wearing and I know this sounds very you know weird to some of you it does to me even to say it but if you're not wearing current fashions if you're not wearing if you don't have a modern haircut all these little tiny nuanced things. It we've had. I have so many memories when Julie and I sold real estate. When we went from selling meat and potato houses to more expensive houses, we would watch people checking us out, mm-hmm. especially the ladies. Frankly, yep. The ladies would look mostly Julie up stem to stern to see how she was dressed, to see what her jewelry was like, her hair was like. You guys do it too. Everybody does it. If it's here, let me reframe this. Let's say, for example, you are at a big real estate conference. And the real estate conference is, you know, let's say there's 250 agents there, but there's an agent there, or let's say the speaker walks in and the speaker is somebody who is maybe just dressed like the rest of you. It looks the same. He or she doesn't look that, you know, up to date. They're a little, you know, it's, they're, they look fine and you wouldn't think anything special about them. They didn't really shine. They didn't really shine, nor did they really look that dull, but nothing special. Doesn't now that same person walks in and they got their act together. They're in good shape. Their clothes look nice. Modern glasses, modern haircut, same presentation. Don't you automatically see or don't you automatically remember that person's presentation uh, as being a lot maybe more effective than had they just looked normal to you? You guys get it? Again, these are moments of truth. These are things, tiny little nuanced things that give you these tiny little. Um, la- again, ladies are experts at this. Ladies, yes. uh, they're you know you guys know all the tiny little things mm-hmm. that make a huge difference. Um, 
But if you are willing to set aside your biases um, against, uh, yes, frankly, a lot of you get to the point where you're, especially older people, I am what I am. You can't teach an old dog new tricks, all these types of things. Well, then don't be surprised when the world starts to pass you by. You're setting yourself up for that because of the will. The fact is, remember, I was giving you guys the example of the the uh, you know Victoria's Secret and the rest of it. They had to meet the customer where they're at. They had to set that experience up so it was what the customer and it, it went down to not just what the people said when they got greeted, but also obviously how they looked. All the tiny little nuanced differences in any single successful business, online or not online, is all designed around these little tiny things. So. Take these things seriously because it does create an aura about you. Sorry for sounding woo-woo, but it does. It gives you this uh, – when people see you or when they think of you, they're all of a sudden going to subconsciously give you perhaps a little bit more, dare I say, credibility or uh, – no, That's I don't, true. I think that's true. It is credibility. True. And it gives you more confidence. You know, the example I use in the book because there's a – big chapter about all of this with lots of different examples. It was uh, Audrey Hepburn who started acting before she had any acting lessons. Somebody liked how she looked, you know, and they cast her in some roles and she's like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. And she wrote about this in some of her memoirs saying the, the most important thing that she says she did was she made sure that she studied that character and dressed the part so that she then could act the part. She led with how she was appearing. So some people would say, well, you know, I think this is all flaky and I shouldn't have to do all of that. Well, you know what? If you embrace it, it's a competitive advantage. And if you blow it off, don't come crying to us because you don't resonate with people. And it doesn't matter what price range you're selling in. This no. is it true in the upper end. This is true in the lower end too. Now, some of you are going to say, and we've had these conversations so many times, well, people in my play, in my market, they wear you know flip-flops every day <laughs> and the rest of it. Okay, that's fine. If you want to basically dig in and say that everyone is, all your customers do business with you because you think it's because you look like them, and then somebody else comes into the marketplace and they look like uh, a, essentially a more updated version. Maybe they're not wearing flip-flops. Maybe they're wearing casual shoes, but they always look a little bit sharper. You're going to lose and you're not going to know why you lost. And you're not going to know. And the seller is, believe it or not, is not going to say, I chose, you know, uh, Steve over Bob. Uh, because you know, most sellers perceive all agents the same, right? At the end of the day, that's how consumer. It's an advantage when you're a new agent. It's a disadvantage as you get more experience because you always have to tell the market why you are. You're, you know, they, you have to remind the market why your experience is worth something to them because they perceive all agents are basically the same. And all of us enter into any like if you're hiring a vet or hiring a roofer or hiring anyone, don't you automatically assume all roofers are the same? Well, all of us do until you learn that there are really huge differences. But we all start with the same biases, right? But if all of a sudden you have not just, let's make it positive, you're not just somebody who has lots of experience, but you haven't let time pass you by. You're somebody who's wearing the latest fashion. You're somebody who looks sharp, who smells good, who drives a nice looking car, who's got all their act together and all their moments of truth. You can actually be kind of crusty and rusty on some of the other things in your presentation. They're going to want, they're going to be attracted to you because you're so attractive. And this is, again, one of the little subconscious lizard brain mm -hmm. types of things that gives you an advantage in, in a com very, very competitive marketplace, especially when you're chasing listings. That's right. So our final point, number five, brush up on your manners by listening to our series of manners podcasts. I think that was a three-part series that all of you guys liked. It's been a few months since we did that, but you can find that wherever you're getting your podcasts. So the bottom line, it really is true that you don't have a second chance to make a first impression. It's also true that this offers you an opportunity to create a competitive advantage for yourself. Curate and polish your moments of truth so you're reflecting your professionalism and you'll feel more confident and competent to handle any type of business from any type of prospect. We should give one little, uh, I mean, just to be a little sure. retro. The uh, always dress one uh, level above the people around you. If you're going to a party tonight and you know everyone's going to be dressed a certain way, you dress one notch up. Now, I'm not saying if everyone's dressed in suits, you show up in a tuxedo, um, you know, but if you go to a, any kind of gathering, uh, Julie, tell your story about when you uh, were a professional musician and no. you would go to orchestra <laughs> practice. This was sort of a covert, unintended lead generation plan. And so, you know, in, in another life, I was a musician. We'd have rehearsals before concerts and, and every rehearsals were always after work. They were like five to seven o'clock at night. Everybody's, you know, gone casual. They came home from work and changed. Well, I was usually coming from a closing or from a listing appointment or something like that, and I looked nicer. I was dressing nicer than everyone else who had thrown on their jeans and sweatpants. But even if you weren't, 
I did it on purpose. You dress nicely on purpose. You would go, even if, for example, it wasn't a closing day, we had yeah. no appointments or whatever. It was just a normal day at the office, you know, closing trans, you know, working files or whatever. You would still, before going to orchestra right. practice, dress up. Because I learned from the first couple of times when it was coming from something, because people would say, oh, you always look so nice. What do you do for a living? And then I could talk about real estate, and that became a conversation about their real estate needs, which became listings many times. And that great center of influence. And that center of influence turned out to be one of our best sources of business to yeah. this day. I know. It's funny, isn't it? It I, is. I, kind of unintentionally, but that is a secret thing you guys can do. People don't necessarily, they won't say, Tim, gosh, you know, where'd you get those glasses? They'll just be like, Tim always looks polished. He has it together. He's clean cut. He's professional. He speaks well. He has good manners. They might not put all of that together. They just have that feeling about you versus not. So these are easy things. I actually, I do do a lot of work with coaching clients on this. We have before and after pictures sometimes, <laughs> which is fun. I know the coaches do this with your clients as well. And it is something fun to work on because it will add to your confidence. If you're somebody that's maybe just becoming a listing agent and competing makes you want to pee your pants sometimes, go there looking more professional because you're going to feel better. I had a coaching client tell me once, very professional. Uh, she surprisingly had just lost a listing to another agent. I said, why was that? And she said, you know, I've given this a lot of thought because you know she rarely lost anything. She said, I am 100% convinced it was my outfit. And I said, tell me about that. She said, well, you know, it's been pretty decent weather around here and, and I wasn't paying attention to the weather and it got super hot. This is one of our uh, Texas clients. It got super hot that day and I was wearing something that was more appropriate for like 55, 60 degrees. She said, I sat there in that listing appointment and I sweat myself to death. I was super uncomfortable. I just wasn't on my game and I know I lost it as a result. So that's something that you can maybe have five outfits for different situations that you're comfortable in. You know you look great. They're curated, and you kick butt in those. Right. And by the way, guys, if you want to know where, if you want to know how to dress, and you're like, you know, frankly, like Julie and I were originally, and not knowing, you know, jack about fashion, you know, spend a little money, have a good closing, go over to start with Nordstroms, and then you know, as you have more money, maybe go over to Neiman's or someplace. Or if you're a man, actually, it's vastly easier to get nice clothes if you're a guy. There are um, places all over the United States where you can walk in and have a really nice suit made for sometimes less than a thousand bucks, a totally custom made suit. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what you're going to if you walk into a Nordstrom's and you want to buy an, an off the rack suit that's not going to fit that well, even after tailoring, that's going to cost you twelve or fifteen hundred bucks easily. But if you walk into some of these custom clothing places, you'll be shocked how six, eight hundred bucks and it'll be completely custom made to your exact sizes. These tiny little things make all the difference. And, you know, I have to say I'm very encouraged by um, like I follow the hashtag uh, realtor, on, hashtag realtor on uh, Instagram mm -hmm. and look at there are always the younger generation millennials. Mm -hmm. They are definitely getting rid of this, you know, at least in real estate this overly casual approach the to grunge. business attire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're completely understanding that it gives them an advantage to look really, really nice. Yes. And I'm encouraged by that. It, it does. And if you have never had anything really tailored to you, maybe you have one shoulder that's a you know, half inch taller or wider than the other. That's when somebody says, you know, you look really crisp. That's what it is. It's when you've had some level of tailor made to you. And it's not, I mean, yes, it's more expensive, but you'll also wear it more often. You'll feel more comfortable and confident in it. I think it's it's really amazing. And the other thing. We talk about this in Harris Rules, we right? We do. Our and book. here's the cool thing, because I was thinking about your guy in Austin that makes your suits. It is a fantastic expansion of your center of influence to be friends with salespeople. Oh, yeah. Who do this sort of thing, because think who their clients are. You Not just anybody off the street walks in and signs up for three tailor-made suits. Think of who their clients are. Talk about real estate when they're measuring you. It's a great way to expand your center of influence. Go to the store, go to the magazine store and just start looking for, um, you know, grab some magazines of things you never would normally buy or go to some websites and start learning more about all these little nuanced differences. Again, go to read our book, Harris Rules. It all lays it out in there as far as the little tiny ideas and suggestions. But this stuff does give you a competitive advantage. It's not, this is part of, for those of you who want to use uh, the word branding, 
this is really a key critical, all these elements are the key critical parts of building a really great brand. You get the best marketing, advertising, and videos and all the rest of it in the world. But if you show up and you don't look like what they expect you to look like or act like you're expect, your manners aren't that good, they're not going to do business with you. These are all the tiny little things that, as I said, they're secrets, uh, but they're truthfully some things that you should know by now as a, you know, you're no longer a kid. These are types of things that everyone should know. By the way, a lot of you guys are contacting Julie and I about eXp Realty. I do get a lot of messages on Instagram about that. Absolutely, Julie and I are associated with eXp Realty, and absolutely we should be having a conversation about you joining eXp Realty as part of our group. We would love to be considered as your sponsors at eXp Realty. You can text me directly at 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206, and it be our pleasure and honor to have the conversation with you about why you should be joining eXp Realty and why you should consider Julie and I as your eXp Realty sponsors. In the meantime, um, you have a fantastic day. Remember, guys, we have thousands of past podcasts waiting for you over on iTunes, Obviously on Stitcher, on Spotify, you can go to our main website, Tim and Julie Harris. On Tim and Julie Harris, the benefit there is you can listen to the podcast and download the notes that we use. We print, we uh, use um, on our website, you get all of our notes. So if maybe you're wanting to do a presentation or go back and review something that we said, it's almost always all of it's on our website at Tim and Julie Harris. If you guys would like to look at pictures of Julie and I torturing ourselves every single day when we do our kettlebell workout as we are uh, living what we preach as with regards to keeping ourselves as crisp as Julie's fond of saying as possible. You can check out our pictures of us doing our kettlebell workouts and the rest of us over on Instagram. And it's a great place to message us as, at well. And our, and our Instagram handle is Tim and Julie Harris. So at Tim and Julie Harris. In the meantime, you guys have a fantastic day. We'll talk to you on the show tomorrow.